Shavuos is interesting. The Kabbalistic roots of Shavuos begin now. When it comes to Pesach, when it comes to Pesach, everybody's doing Pesach. I bet all your friends and family are preparing a few days before Pesach. They're like cleaning the house. They're getting ready for Seder night. All the little arguments are going on about who's going to sit next to who in the Seder. And you didn't invite that aunt and you didn't invite that cousin and all the breaks is happening. And, you know, everyone's preparing for Pesach. What's up, Rivka? Nice to see Riff Rivka's in the house all the way from Los Angeles. So we have a question. Potentially the day, which is even more important than Pesach, the day we received the Torah, the day we married God, the day we became Jewish, the day that if not for this, there would be no Torah, there would be no Pesach. Why, oh why, oh why, oh why, do most of your friends and family not really know about what's going on in a few days time and they're not really, they're not really changing their plans. You know, it's the Jubilee here in, in the UK. A lot of people are planning, you know, their trips to, to Hyde Park at Buckingham Palace or whatever else they're going to be doing in the Jubilee. And yet, potentially the most important spiritual day of the year, most people don't know about. If you say Pesach, Passover, people know. If you say Shavuot, they say Shavuot. They say Shavuot. What's that? Why is that? Why? Why is it the Shavuot as opposed to Pesach and Rosh Hashanah, like everyone's there, Yom Kippur? The whole of Tel Aviv are doing Yom Kippur, right? There's, there's not even any, any cars in the street and buses. But yes, yeah, Shavuot, you see cheesecakes in the shop in, in Tel Aviv. There'll be some cheesecakes going on. There'll be, um, but you're not going to have anywhere near. I would, I, would, I would guess, just based on my knowledge of maybe my like 10,000 people that I know and my, you know, 50 years experience in this world, my little guess would be Pesach, right now, the Jewish people, maybe 70, 80 percent were keeping Pesach. Shavuot, probably down, this is hard for me to say, to close to like 20, close to 20 percent. So what is that about? Where, where's, why the discrepancy between Pesach and Shavuot? And the answer is always found in Kabbalah like everything. But the energy of Pesach is what's called in, in Kabbalah, the awakening from above. The energy from Pesach comes to a house near you, whether you like it or not, whether you're prepared or not. We couldn't have been more unprepared than when we were in Egypt on the 49th lowest level, worshiping idols. And yet Hashem lifts us out and rescues us. That's Pesach, and actually that's Rosh Hashanah, and that's Yom Kippur. But my dear friends, on Shavuot, that's a day where it's down to you. And that's the deep, deep, deep explanation of why Shavuot is called Shavuot. Shavuot, what does Shavuot mean, anyone? Put on Zoom, on Facebook. It's time for you to interact with a rabbi, right? Anyone like to message in? What, what does Shavuot mean? What does the word Shavuot mean? Doesn't mean cheesecake, it means weeks. It means weeks. Our professor from Brazil is saying it's weeks. It is, it's weeks. What? So let, let me ask you, hello, weeks? What's that about? I would have thought like Sinai, cheesecake, Torah time, Moses, Ten Commandments, marriage. Why is it called weeks? Go on, James, we'd be counting weeks. So what? So what? So everything, so everything. Meaning, you only get access to the cheesecake. In other words, you only get access to the spiritual energy of Shavuos if you've been preparing. It's not a free gift for everybody, I'm afraid. There's a code to get it. You know, sometimes you know, there's, you know, there's a shul that, that I told David to go to in Golders Green. And the problem with that shul is there's a big code on the door. And if you don't know the code, you don't get in. You need to know the code to get in. Shavuos is a little bit like there's a code to get in. And by the way, the code we're going to see to get in, first and foremost, is I want to get in. Hashem, I love you. I mean, Hashem is so kind to you. Just have to say, Hashem, please, and you're in. But if you don't say that, unfortunately, Shavuos can go right over your head. And you've missed the whole magic of Shavuos, tragically. So those of you who are with me right now are blessed because you are the chosen ones. You're the chosen ones amongst the chosen ones. Because you're the ones, for whatever reason, it's in your heart. 
that you want to connect to Hashem and you, and you want to be the best you can be and you want to connect to the Torah. So Hashem said, of course, it's very important that you prepare correctly, especially now. This is called the three days before Shavuot, the Shlosh Bala, the Torah. If you look in Exodus, says that God told Moses to prepare the Jewish people. There's three days, very important, prior to the Ten Commandments, where you have to do a lot of spiritual prep, which actually we're meant to be doing right now. And we're going to teach you a little, a little bit about that. So let's just do that before we get deep, just practically a few things. Between now and Saturday night, Motei Shabbat is when the Ten Commandments are going to be heard around the world. So between now and then, I highly recommend you start working out, A, which portion of Torah you want. It says in the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah that on, on, on the, it's a new year of Shabbat. It's the new year for fruit. Do you know that? It says our Peirot. It says, it says Peirot are judged, even though Tu Bishvat is the new year for trees, it says for peirot, fruit, the atzeret, the judge for fruit. Now, what is that connected to? It says the Zohar, that there's, we're all connected to the tree of life. The tree of life is the Torah. Ilona de The Torah is called the tree of life. And we are all the fruit of the tree of life. So it's going to be decided which aspect of Torah you're going to receive, which fruit you're going to be. Are you going to be a banana, a pear, or an apple, or an orange? Are you going to be a Kabbalist this year? Are you going to be someone who's going to be connected to Shabbos, going to be connected to Chumash, going to be connected to Jewish law, going to be connected to Jewish history, going to be connected to yourself, going to be connected to Jewish philosophy? What, which rabbis are you going to be connected to? That's all going to be decided on, the, on, on Shavuos. Shavuos, the Chag of Shavuot is going to connect you for the next 12 months and give you your maximum spiritual capacity based on what's in your heart. So it's incumbent upon us to start doing prep, to start thinking, which aspect of Torah do I want? Have, can, I, can I up my game? Like I'm so proud of James. Every time I see James, he's learning and he's in Kolo and he's, he's upped his game this year tremendously. And all of you, you know, I know David very well. David's upped his game tremendously. Murder's upped her game. Cyril's upped his game. You've all upped your game. It's ridiculous. I love it. A bit, the goal is, do you want to continue up in your game? And I hope you do. And, and if you do, you say to Hashem, help me maximize my, my portion in Torah. And that's going to be decided. And therefore, you need to do spiritual work, prepare a little, maybe learn a little bit more about what Shavuos is, do, do some prep on that. The amazing Talmud about that is found in Tractate Shabbat. If you want to write this down, James, Tractate Shabbat. I highly recommend you look at this page 86 to 87 to 89 page 87 to 89 is the famous tractate on shabbat all about the inspiration of shavuos very inspiring i'm going to quote you a little bit from that and that's a good way to prepare for the guys go to the mikvah for the for the for the girls do a work on prayer work on tehillim read the book of ruth it's a great prep for for shavuot l'chaim everybody l'chaim l'chaim and reading the book of Ruth will be a good prep. And, and tonight's topic will be a good prep as we'll see when we get to the end of it. Okay, let's, let's jump in. So the energy, my friends, this Saturday night is unlike any other night. It's literally, it's, it's a night like the day of Yom Kippur has this incredible power. So the nights of Shavuot and Saturday night, my dear friends, don't sleep Saturday night if you can. Don't go out to clubbing or party, right? But if you can stay up learning Torah, if you can stay up really going to synagogue, if you can stay and, and pray, if you can say to Hillim, read the book of Ruth, try and stay up for as long as you can. And ideally try and stay up till sunrise and then pray and then hear the Ten Commandments. And ideally all in synagogue. Someone asked for Shlomo Zalman, they asked in one minute, if I do that, that means I'm like going to sleep a lot of Sunday. My whole day is going to be ruined. And I'm actually going to learn less Torah for the rest of Shavuot if I stay up all night. And they asked him, what do I do? And he says, very good point. You're making a very logical point. I agree with you. But stay up anyway, because this is the custom for the Jewish people. This is the way to really maximize the spiritual energy coming down. If your soul is alive and kicking, you can't sleep. You won't be able to sleep. The Neshama can't sleep. I can't sleep Shavuot night. It's crazy. I, I'm, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, on, I'm buzzing, buzzing. Because, it's, because your soul is feeling Sinai. Hashem is going to give us the Ten Commandments. He gives it to us every year. We're not commemorating an event that was 
We're celebrating an event that is every year on the 6th of Sivan, Hashem renews the Torah. Hashem renews our, our, our wedding vows. We're getting remarried. Mazel tov, everybody. You're getting married on Saturday night. Actually, the wedding is early Sunday morning at sunrise. That's when the Ten Commandments is, is, is given. And that's when the magic really happens. But it's throughout the night. And if you stay up that night and learn Torah throughout that night and really work hard not to speak Lashon Hara, you will see tremendous blessings this year. Mark my words. You will see it. And then you message me later during the year when you say, wow, I've had such an amazing year. Really, it's worth it. And by the way, I say, no, I have to go to sleep. Question for you. How many of you normally on Saturday, they go out partying anyway? You go out and you go and chill out and go and have fun. So don't give me like I need to be in bed early Saturday night. Like it's Hashem is even kind to you this year. He's made it on Saturday night. on Motti Shabbos when you're normally out anyway. So now you might as well go out to party with Hashem and, 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 go, and go out to, to learn Torah and, and enjoy that incredible energy. So that's going to happen now. Why the other practical thing I, I urge you to do is prepare your house that we have a three day for those outside of Israel. In Israel, it's a 48 hour for those outside Israel. It's a three day Shabbat Yom Tov. So really between now and Shabbat, start preparing. Try and have that um, hot plate, which can keep some food hot, buy some food prepared. Try and keep the lights on the way you want it. And if you want to know more about how to keep the laws of Shavuot, then, then happy to message me later. But there's a lot to prepare for. Even if you don't normally do it, it's worth just doing a little bit extra. Always just one step at a time, just a little bit extra will, will, will be remarkable and will create an incredible connection for you to Hashem. Okay, let's get into Kabbalah. You ready? Here we go. Question number one. Katy, nice to see you. It's been a long time. What's up on Facebook? So nice to see you. Still, you can um, tag some more people on Facebook. We, don't, we like tagging and liking because it helps with the algorithm. Okay. Here we go. Question number one. I've told you this before. I'll, I'll repeat it. The story of Shavuot is found in Exodus. It's actually found in Deuteronomy as well. Hashem goes to all the nations of the world, it says. Before we came to the Jewish people, he first of all went to the nation of Esau. He went to the Romans. He went to the, 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 the you know, Edomites. He went to Aesop. He went to the angel of Aesop and said, do you want the Torah? And they said, what's in it? And Hashem says, don't murder. And they said, nah, don't want it. Hashem then goes to the nation of Yishmael and says, do you want the Torah? And they said, what's in it? And Hashem said, don't steal. And they said, no, thank you. Hashem went to the nation of the Moabites. And he said, do you want the Torah? And they said, what's in it? And Hashem said, don't commit adultery. And they said, what are we going to do every night then? So no, thank you. So then finally he comes to the Jewish people and says, do you want the Torah? And we said, depends. How much does it cost? So Hashem said, it's free. We said, we'll take two. Actually, we didn't say that. What actually happened, my friends, is Hashem says, do you want the Torah? And for the first time ever, we signed a contract without reading it. Jewish people do not sign contracts without reading it. We signed the contract without reading it. And we said, which means we'll do and we'll try and figure it out as we go along. Now I said, we're just going to do it. And then we'll come to understand it and connect to it. We'll do it and we'll understand it. And, I, and, and the angel said, who's revealed to you the secrets of the angels? That's, that's our line. We say, who told you our secrets? We knew the secrets. And we said, Nasa Vinishma. Based on that, there's a famous Talmud in Bukharat, page eight, where the Greeks, the, the elders of Athens, went to a great sage and said, we're the chosen people. We know in your book, Hashem come to Aesop first. And we're from Aesop, so we're really the chosen people. We're the ones who we asked first to marry. You know, normally the first guy, first girl you go and propose to, that's kind of your option one. And then when she turns you down, you start like scraping and the bottom of the barrel and you start going to someone else. And then third time, you're really desperate, by the way. That's a bit of a joke. Don't take it seriously. But, but that's kind of the point, what the elders of Athens are saying. We are genuinely the chosen people. So the rabbi said something very deep. He said, when you knock a peg into a wall, you find a place which is hollow, you're knocking around, and only when you find a place which is hollow, do you put it in. So question number one is, what did the rabbi mean when he, elder, he answered the elders of Athens? A whole metaphor with a peg and a wall. 
That's a good question. The elders of Athens ask, where they're the real chosen people. Which, by the way, that's one of the points within, within Christianity. When the, when the Christians say we're the chosen people, it's not merely that God divorced the Jews, so they claim. He didn't, by the way. But they claim that God divorced the Jews and when the temple was destroyed and therefore was married them. And they're really the chosen people because after all, they were the ones proposed to first. First of all, Hashem said, I'm only going to marry you, the Jews. And then he says, I'm going to marry you for eternity. And the point is, Rabbi Yochanan said, even the proposal that he made wasn't a genuine proposal. And he explains it via the metaphor of the peg in the wall. Question number one is, how does the peg in the wall, anyone like to, to message in? What do you think the rabbi meant when he said, when you knock a peg in the wall, you find a hollow place and then you put it in? How is that the answer to the elders of Athens questions? You can message in if you can think of an answer. Facebook or Instagram or Zoom. Or YouTube, for those watching on YouTube. So let me know. By the way, if any of you haven't yet, haven't yet signed up to our YouTube channel, please subscribe even now on to J Network 613 on YouTube. And we're putting hopefully a wealth of, of Jewish inspirational talks from an array of great speakers on there. So don't miss it. Okay. Thank you, James. You're the man. Question number one. Question number two, the following. Says the Talmud, which is the one the Talmud I want you to learn over Shavuot or even the prep for Shavuot. On page 88 in Shabbat, tractate Shabbat, page 88. B, it says the following. Sorry, 88A, it says the following. There's a Pasuk says in Genesis, by Yitzyatsu Batachti Zahar, and they stood underneath the mountain. The Jewish people stood underneath the mountain. How do you stand underneath the mountain? Has anyone ever stood underneath mountains? You're kind of dead if you stand underneath the mountain. It's kind of where you get buried. What does it mean to stand on? As the Bible says in Genesis, we stood underneath the mountain. Says the Talmud, what it meant is the following. Hashem said, oh, by the way, everybody, just let me ask you once more. Do you want the Torah? And watch this. He took Mount Sinai, metaphorically, or maybe even literally, who knows well, how well the Talmud means by this based on the Midrash, he took it over our heads and said, and if you say no, Sham Tzahei there will be your burial place. Let me ask you a question, everybody. Does that sound romantic? Cyril, when you're looking to please God, I give you a blessing that one day soon, at the right time, you're going to propose to your soulmate, say amen, I want to hear an amen, right? Say amen. So but when you do that, please don't take a gun and point it to her head and say, will you marry me? And if you say no, that will be the last thing you say. Please do not do that, Cyril. That's not romantic. It's not going to go down well. Um, it's really not going to work. And yet it seems Hashem did that. Hashem said, and we'd already said, Nasev and Ishma. We'd already said, we'll do it. We already said, yes, Hashem said, will you marry me? And we say, absolutely, no problem. We're there. Tell us where and when. And yet even then, Hashem is now threatening us and taking the Mount Sinai and putting it over our head like a barrel and saying, we say, no, we're going to drop it. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Again, please message in. You have an explanation for why on earth Hashem would hover Mount Sinai over our head. It makes no sense. Question two. Question three. Any of you ever watched Mission Impossible? Oh, before Mission Impossible. Before Mission Impossible. The Talmud says the following. Moses, this is what happened. On the 6th of Sivan, Hashem spoke. To all of us, three million people heard Hashem speak. No other religion has that. Every other religion, one person says, I heard God speak. The Bible claims that Judaism doesn't come from Moses. It comes from all of us. Hashem, and by the way, Verda, you heard it. We all heard it. Every single one of us heard it. And by the way, those who convert, we're taught, were all at Sinai as well. They just got lost through the generations. Every single Jewish person heard the Ten Commandments at Sinai. We heard it. We were there. We were there. And, and we received the Ten Commandments. The first two Hashem said, the last eight Moses said. And then we were taught really much more of the Torah. And then Moshe went up after Shavuot. And he, lay, he, he walked up Sinai, he lay down on the top of the mountain, and he had an out of body experience for the next 40 days, which is a miracle in itself because he was able to live without eating or drinking. For 40 days, it was a, a proper transcendence. 
And in that time, this is what happened. Much says the Talmud, that's why this Talmud is a magic. It starts telling what's going on in the spiritual world. Those who like mysticism will love this piece of Talmud. Rivka, you can do an Instagram live about that piece of Talmud. It's all about angels, it's mad. So Moses goes up to the world of the souls and he walks in and the angels are like, what are you doing? You're trespassing. Humans aren't allowed here. No humans allowed. Can't you see the signs? No humans allowed. Hmm. Masha says, um, the gods like invited me to come. It says the scariest piece of Talmud. It says the angels wanted to beat him up. It says they wanted to hurt him. Whatever they, that means, I don't even know what that means. They wanted to hurt him. They, it's like he's inappropriate. And Hashem says, I'm about to give him the Torah. Him and his people are going to get the Torah. And this is what the angel said. You're about to give them the most coveted, beautiful treasure to that lot. Do you know what it's a bit like? Imagine a scene, God forbid, this would ever happen. But there was a pigsty with 10 pigs holding a safer Torah. We would, we would be disgusted. We would quickly go and save the safer Torah. That's how they felt about us. Because from their perspective at that point, humans are animalistic. We do actions of animals. We have inclinations of animals. And therefore, and therefore, the angels are like, what are you doing? We should be getting the Torah. We're the spiritual beings. The Torah is a spiritual truth. We should be getting the Torah, not these human animalistic beings who are just, you know, having Coca-Cola. They shouldn't be having it. So Hashem says to Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, I'd like you to answer them. Moshe turned to Hashem and said, I'm petrified. Maybe they're going to burn me. They're going to burn me with a fire. So Hashem says, hold on to my throne. Don't worry. Give them an answer. So Moshe says, okay. And then he looked at the angels and he says, close his eyes. He started channeling. He said to them, angels, what's the first of the Ten Commandments? We Jewish people, that's why rabbis, we like to ask questions. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, he's under attack. He asked the angels a question. He says, what's the first of the Ten Commandments? And they're like, no, no, we're asking your questions. So Don't be cheeky. He said, okay. It is, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. Angels, were you in Egypt? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's not about you. The Torah is not for you. It's for us. The Jewish people are the ones that went to Egypt. Which again, by the way, when other people say that they're the chosen people, mm, were they in Egypt? The slaves? I don't think so. So the, 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 the nation, the Hashem says, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. Who took you from the house of slavery. Obviously. The nation that Hashem chose are the nation that were saved in Egypt. They called the Jewish people. Aslo. So the angels are like, mm, okay, good point. And Hashem, then, he, then he starts getting cocky, to be honest. Then he starts getting excited. He starts seeing he's, he's, he's winning now. He says to the angels, angels, what's the fifth of the Ten Commandments? And they say, honor your father and mother. And he says, angels... Who's your mom, angels? You don't even have a dad, angels. You don't have a mama, angels. And he starts making fun. They don't have a mama and papa and dada because they're angels. And, and so therefore, they're not cut out for the Torah. We, human beings, that do come from parents, male humans, we hope, then the Torah is for us. The Torah is cut out for the Jewish people. And the angels looked at Moshe and they said, oh, we're so sorry. You're so right. Please, please stay. Please take our apologies. Please take all our gifts. And when he left after 40 days, it says they sent him back with gifts, which, by the way, some of those gifts were Kabbalah. Some of those gifts were the Zohar. Some of those gifts, were some of the mystical secrets that we like to share in our, our classes. So here's the question, my friends. Ask the Chasm Sofa. What, what just went on there? What's going on? Angels know the truth. Angels knew about the Torah. Angels know that the Torah says, I am Hashem, you've got to talk about Egypt. Moshe didn't give them any deep, complicated answer. He just told them commandment number one, commandment number five. He spoke about also, are you, it's, it says, don't be jealous, are you jealousy? 
They, he didn't tell them anything they didn't know. So what was the big epiphany that the angels had? What was the big shift? And Mushra initially was really scared to answer them. And then all of a sudden he answered them and he told them ABC and they said, oh my God, you're so right. I'm so sorry, Moses. Please take my apology. What just happened? Do you all understand the question? James, you with me on that question? You got the question? How do we understand that piece of Talmud where angels initially didn't believe we should receive the Torah? And then by simply Moses saying, it says, honor your parents and you don't have parents. It says, Hashem, I am the good Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. They said, oh, you're right. They knew it was there. They knew about that. They knew it said that. It's like me, me saying to you, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five. And you're like, oh my gosh, you're right. That's the answer to all my problems. What's actually happened there? He's given them ABC. That's question number three. Question number four. As I was saying to you about Mission Impossible, and if you see Mission Impossible, where apparently there's a new one out going to be soon, and there's, it's going to be like, it's, it's cool, like you don't know who's talking to who, because you're, you're talking to someone, all of a sudden they just take their mask off, and it's not really them. So I've got news for you, Tom Cruise didn't come up with that. Judaism came up with that, because the Midrash in Exodus says that one of the answers that Moses gave the angels when the angel says, you shouldn't be receiving the Torah. Hashem says to Moshe, take off your mask. Reveal who's hiding behind the mask. And he took off his mask. And you know who it was? Anyone like to harbor a guest? Come on, on Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, tell me. YouTube, who do you think it was? Who was hiding behind Moshe's face? Who's really the face behind Moses? Anyone guess? Anyone guess? Anyone guess? Anyone guess? Bit of a guess is connected to tonight. Another guess, it's in the Bible. Another guess, he's the first Jewish person. Just giving it away. The answer is Abraham. My name's Abraham, right? So is Abraham. He was Abraham Rivka. Moshe revealed Avram Avinu. Underneath that mask was Avram Avinu. And they're like, whoa, Avram Avinu. Whoa, what was I thinking? Of course. You're right. You do deserve the Torah. Oh my gosh. We're not going to say another word. Really? Why is Avraham like firmer than Moshe? I don't think so. He's got a bigger beard. I'm not sure. Like why should Tasha, the angels be like, oh, it's Avraham. He's got more letters in his name than Moshe. So he, like, what's the big deal? Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't get better than Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't enough to like inspire them. They needed like to go back 500 years and see Abraham. Why is Abraham the answer in Moshe? Is that's question number four. And finally, question number five, there's one mitzvah that Hashem asked the Jewish people to do at Sinai. And that one mitzvah, that one mitzvah was, anyone know? Do you know what the mitzvah was? Don't touch the mountain. It was a mitzvah not to touch the mountain. It's a bit like, you know, if you go to a pop concert, people want to be in the front row and they want to touch the stars and they want to touch the stage. And everyone's like, so, so, I'm not making the comparison in any way shape or form just a little bit of a metaphor for you but it seemed that there was a desire to touch the mountain and god was saying don't touch the mountain what's the whole don't touch the mountain those are my five questions let's just go through the five questions okay can anyone message in what are the five questions see if anyone was actually listening to five anyone actually there which by the way this is a prep for shavuos because you meant to learn torah to think torah to remember torah this should help you so here we go question number one was why why is the answer to the elders of Athens, where they said, are you the chosen people, the peg in the wall? He says, I'm not a peg in the wall, question one. Question two, we asked, if we already said, Nasev and Ishma, if we said we'll do it, then why did Hashem have to hover the barrel over our heads? If Cyril would ever propose with the guns of girl's heads, I would be very, very upset with him, super upset. Question number three, it's, a pli it's, it's not the pen, it's a, um, a peg, peg, a peg in the wall. Number three, we asked was, trying if I can remember, number three, we asked, why is it that Moses answers to the angels, I am Hashem, you've got to take you out of Egypt. How did that silence the angels? Question number four was, how does the face of Abraham silence the angels? And question number five is, why did God say, don't touch the mountain? In order to find out the answer to these five deep questions, like the five books of the Torah. So we're getting ready for Shavuot by connecting to the number five. There's one concept which hopefully will answer all the questions. And here's the concept. 
Let's talk about love for a minute. Do you mind? Can we talk about love, Berda? Is that okay with you? You up for a bit of love, love talk for a few minutes? Here we go. A bit of love talk. There's a really cool book I super recommend. It's called Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus. Or my way of putting it, Hashem has got a sense of humor sometimes. And like a lot of times. Hashem like has a laugh sometimes because he says to two souls, I'd like you to spend the rest of your life with each other. And you are going to be so different. You're going to drive each other up the wall. Give you an example. Let's talk about me for a moment. Thankfully, my wife's not listening. And hopefully she won't listen to this talk. So I think I'm good. It's not Loshanara, but um, it's, it's probably Loshanara myself, which you also can't do, but I've done bigger sins. So here's the point. Listen up. Me and my wife, we couldn't be more opposites. So opposites. You know, I like the music up. She likes the music down. I like it cold. She likes it hot. I like to eat meat. She likes to eat milk. I like to make a mess. She definitely does not like to make a mess. You know, one I've told some of you this before, when we just got married, there was one night my wife couldn't sleep. She literally couldn't sleep. She's like can't sleep and I'm like are you okay darling like is there mosquitoes is there like very hot in the room can I help she goes Avi your socks are on the floor I've never in my life had socks on a floor when I'm trying to sleep before ever and I'm like whoa I didn't realize I've got like rock and roll socks like making a crazy noise I didn't realize like they're waking you up like it's funny I can't hear the noise at all like I'm so sorry they're bothering you I put them on mute and she's like, no, 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 I'll put you on mute. Get rid of those socks. Put them in, in, in where the socks are meant to go. And they're dirty. And I'm like, oh man, my life's going to change forever. At that moment, I realized I can't have socks on the floor where my wife could see them. I now have to have hiding places for the socks. But my point was, my point was that I needed to learn how to change and learn how to not be such a messy person and, and not to be such a slob. I'll give you another example. This thing to do with me and my wife. Someone came to see me a few years ago. And they said, Rabbi, we need your help. We heard you're a bit of like a, a marriage coach. Can you help me? I said, like, hey, we'll see if I can do. And the guy says, I just don't understand my wife. I said, okay, welcome to the club. I said, what happened? And, and he, he said, well, I came home yesterday and all my shirts were on the floor. My wife had taken out all the shirts from my cupboards and thrown them down the stairs on the floor and said the following, I am never, ever, ever going to iron you a shirt ever again. So I said, okay, then what happened? He says, so then I put them all in a sack, took them to the dry cleaner, got them to make, press them very nicely and brought them back home as you do. And when she saw I did that, she starts shouting again. She said, didn't you listen to a word I said? And I'm really confused because she said she's not going to iron anymore. I now went and took them to dry cleaning. What's the problem? So I said, you silly sausage. That's what we say in England. You're a silly sausage. You, oh, yeah. It's not what a woman says. It's why she says it. She didn't mean I'm never going to iron a shirt anymore. Right, Verda? Message in. What did she mean? She means... Why haven't you shown me appreciation? Why haven't you said thank you? Why are you taking me for granted? Just say thank you. That's all I made. And you, by taking the shirts to the dry cleaner, means you didn't hear a word she said. Meaning, Hashem creates men and women who are wired differently. When I get back from work, I just want to go and chill out for an hour. And as the book says, go into my cave. And when my wife comes back from work, she just wants to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk in fact one of the funny things in our house is the moment my wife wakes up she's like full of the joys of spring and she wants like a deep philosophical discussion and i'm like uh, uh, what day is it what planet are we on and 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 somehow we have to meet our self in the middle so why is hashem done that well i'll give you one final example this is quite an expensive one my wife turned 40 years old and she said, okay, I've decided what I want for my present. I said, oh, awesome. You want a cake? What do you want? She goes, I want a new engagement ring. And I'm like, hmm, 
okay i thought we we're engaged already we did that like 20 years ago and been there done it got the ring and the t-shirt and the veil really we're gonna get engaged again and no another ring again and then the thing about my wife is it took me a bit of time sometimes you just know when they're being serious and she was being serious so there was no point even having a discussion because she wanted a new ring she was going to get a new ring so that's fine because and we have a way of getting my wife jewelry, which is the following. I used to make the big mistake when I was younger. And I used to go and actually buy the jewelry, bring it home. And my wife would say, oh, that's really nice. Thank you so much. Do you have the receipts? Do you have the receipts? And I'd be like, uh, lost it. But, and, and, and then I learned like, what's the point? She knows what she likes. She knows what she likes. So what I used to do is say, here's a credit card. Or sometimes like we go together and then she would buy it. So I said, darling, you choose the ring. Tell me how much it is. And, I could it. and she goes, no, 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 no. Not this time. Not this time. This is too precious. This time you're going to choose the ring. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get it so wrong. I haven't got a clue. Whatever I do is always wrong. She says, no, no, obviously you're not going to buy the ring, but you're going to buy the ring. I'm like, I thought I got you after 20 years and now. I realized I'm as clueless. What do you mean? Am I buying the ring? Are you buying the ring? Who's buying the ring? If I buy it, I'm going to get it wrong. What do you want? And my wife explained, no, no, this is what's going to happen. You are going to learn all about rings. You're going to go into the world of knowing what a ring. You're going to basically come into my head. And together, together, genuinely together, we are going to buy a ring. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to take time. And I hopped, I hopped because what my wife wants, and I think just what every woman wants, is to be at one with their soulmate, is just to be at one. That there shouldn't be two egos walking on this planet. The two becomes one. You know, the famous Sadiq of Ari Levin once said in his, the doctor's sur surgery when his wife wasn't well, and the doctor said, what's wrong? He said, our toe hurts us. Our toe hurts us. His wife's toe, he calls his toe. They got to such a level of unity of oneness. That's love. That's why in Kabbalah, the numerical value of the word echad, aleph, chet, dalet is 13. The numerical value of the word ahva, love, is 13. That's what love is. Love is unity. Love is oneness. The way to achieve love, my friends, is learning how to let go of the ego, learning how to let go of our own narrative, learning how to let go of our own biases, learning how to let go of our triggers, of our desires. You know, when now I want meat, she wants milk. When we go out together, what we then swapped, I wanted to make her happy. I wanted to go to milk. She wants to make me happy. She wanted to go and have me. And then we found our way. If it's daytime, we do milk. And if it's nighttime, we do meet, just my wife always wants to go out in the day. But, but the truth is, but the truth is that we've learned how to fuse into one. You know, and it's please gotta be our 30th year anniversary. And I can say we're, we're more one than ever because we've learned each other's world. We've learned each other's senses. That they don't, we don't have to say what we wanna say and we understand what each other's saying. That's what love's about. Now we understand what Shavuos is about. Because my dear friends, Shavuos is the ultimate love story. One of the reasons we have love, the key reason we have love in this world, the key reason we have the idea of a soulmate, the idea of marriage, is to give us a metaphor about the real marriage, the real one, the real love, which is between us and Hashem. Our job is to become one with Hashem. When we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elikeinu Hashem Echod, Hashem is one. It means Hashem is oneness and I am part of it. That all there is is that oneness. It's not like me there and God there, and I'm trying to like find compromises. Like marriage should not be about compromise. It should be about giving and giving and giving. And religion should be about giving and giving and giving and fusing into oneness and becoming one with Hashem. It's the ultimate love story. That's why King Solomon is comparing it to the love between the man and the woman. That's why it says. Famous line, Ani le dodi ve dodi li. Hashem says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is for me. It's the ultimate love story. And therefore, now let's start on to going through the questions. Question one we asked The elders of Athens said, 
they said to Hashem, they said to the, the rabbi, we're the chosen people, because Hashem came to us first and says, do you want the Torah? And we turned him down. I think it was Rabbi Shmuel who, who took the peg and put it in the, in the wall and found a place which is hollow, and only when it was hollow then did he put the peg in. Meaning, it was never a real proposal. Hashem was waiting for the Jews. Because we are the ones who, from Abraham, spent 500 years training to receive Hashem. To be there unconditionally for Hashem. It says in Pirkei Ovis, if you want a love which lasts forever, it's a love which is unconditional. If you have a love which is conditional, once the condition ends, the love ends. But love which loves for, lasts forever is unconditional love. Hashem is waiting for unconditional love. He was waiting for a, a place in the wall which is hollow, the place in the wall which didn't have its own ego as such. He was waiting for us. We are the only ones that Hashem genuinely proposed to. Question number two. Why then? Once we said, Nasevinishma, that's why we said, whatever he, when you say, jump, Hashem, how high? Of course we'll do what you say. So then why did Hashem have to Hover the barrel over our heads. I'll tell you something deep. I'll tell you something deep. Because it was insufficient when we said Nasa Vinishba. Because when we said we will do and then we'll understand it, we still were the instigators of that comment. We still said we will do. We could have thought that it's on our agenda. We could have been mistaken and said, when it suits me, I'll do it. You know, my mother had, thank God, the most beautiful marriage with my dad, nearly 50 years, they had 49 years together and they became literally inseparable. But the downside of that is when you have an amazing marriage and one a partner dies, it can be reduced really hard. And there was, a, there was a line my mom said, which was, I don't know if I can live without him. I don't know if I can live without him. The Maharala Prague says, Hashem loves us so much, he can't live without us. That's why he hovered the Mount Sinai over our heads, to say we have to say yes, because there's no point of the world. There's no point of the world existing if we say no. The whole world was created for us to say yes. Voracious, borrow Elohim. In the beginning, Hashem created the world. Rashi says, voracious for the sake of the marriage to the Jewish people. We are called racists, the first fruits. We are the reasons why Hashem made the world. That marriage between us and Hashem is why Hashem made the world, my friends. We had to say yes. It was a no-brainer. We had no option. The Maharal says, just like oxygen, you haven't, it's not optional to breathe. So I've got news for you. If we want to have a relationship to Hashem, we need the Torah. That is our oxygen. More than that, and this is deep, it's almost Hashem's oxygen. It's what makes God alive to be able to have the relationship with us. That makes him fulfill the purpose of creation. The reason why Hashem built the world is to have this, inner, this unconditional love with us. We have no choice but to say yes, but that's beautiful. That's the ultimate love story. That's the story between Ruth and Naomi that she says, wherever you go, I go. I can't live without you. My dear friends, we need, we need to get to a place where we say to Hashem, Hashem, I can't live without you. We need to get to that level. If you're not that level, there's more to go. And more to go. That's your heart. That's Hashem and the Bechol the Vodka, Bechol Nashka, Bechol Nodak. You should love Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. To answer question three, when Moshe went up and said, and the angel said, You don't deserve to be here. You shouldn't get the Torah. The key words, Hashem says, Hold on to my throne. Take my hand. Let's demonstrate to the angels that you can be one with me, that you, a human being, can be part of oneness. My dear friends, Cyril, James, Berda, Roberta, Rivka, friends on Facebook and on, on Instagram, we have the capacity of, even though we're at times animals and homo sapiens where we're seemingly so far away, we've got part of Hashem in us. And through making good decisions, we can be part of God. We are part of God. We can hold on to his throne. Please, God, we'll all get a chance to hold on to his throne. The angels couldn't believe that. And when he said, I am Hashem, you've got, they knew he says that, but they didn't know he would know the deeper secrets of it. 
They didn't know that we'd be able to understand it from the perspective of becoming one with Hashem. They couldn't believe that. They thought they deserved to become one with Hashem. But ironically, they don't have free will. We're greater than angels. Because when you are now choosing to learn Torah, you've got so many things you could do right now. You could be on Netflix. You'd be Netflix binging. You could be surfing the internet. You could be on Tinder. You could be doing a multitude. Maybe you are. You could be doing a multitude of things, yet you're choosing to learn Torah right now. Angels don't choose to learn Torah. Angels just are when you choose to learn the secret of an angel. We choose to say, I'm going to subjugate my will to you. Whatever you say, Hashem, which is really what we're meant to do in marriage. We're meant to say, even if I don't understand you, I'm there. I can assure you there's been thousands of times when I don't understand my wife. If she wants it, I do it. Because that's what marriage is meant to be about. Number four, why did Moshe Rabbeinu reveal the face of Abraham? Because my dear friends, Abraham is the one who embodies love and kindness. He taught the world kindness. He prepared us for the Torah because here's the point. The prerequisite for receiving the Torah is to be a lover, is to be someone who's kind. Derech, Eretz, Padma la Torah, which means before you can be religious, you need to be a mensch. That's what religiousness actually means, to be kind. And how do we know that? Abraham even invited the angels. He was the one that said to the angels, come and eat. Let me look after you. Let me give you some food, angels. When he did an act of giving to the angels, when the angels realized that's who we are, we're the nation of givers. We're the nations of humble humans who can erode the ego. They realize, wow, you really can receive the Torah. And that's why Hashem says, don't touch the mountain. Because the way, and this is the job we need to do between now and Shavuot and on Shavuot. We need to learn to have self-control. As King Solomon said, so, turn away and do good. It's not about, I want to do this, this, this. We need to, because you could be doing that from an ego place. We have to learn how to take that ego and squash it and say, what is it you want? What is it you want? Not what I want. The Torah isn't what I want. It is a buffet. I'll take a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. The Torah is, what do you want from me? Hashem, how can I be of service tonight? Society, how can I be of service today? My community, how can I, how I be of service? Not how can you serve me? Not what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? That's what it means to be the Jewish people. And that elements of self-control, and that's one of the preps we need to do between our and what We need to show Hashem that we can be in self-control, that we can erode the ego. To finish off with, I want to share with you something which blew my mind this week from a tzaddik called Moshe Weinberg. And he says the following. In fact, I'll start with a parable. There was a, a couple who were married for many years. And, and after a while, the love started going and they, they stopped feeling it. And the guy especially wasn't giving her the right attention and focus and priority. And the promises they made weren't so much being met. And they started going further and further distance. And eventually the woman says, I'm done. Can you give me a divorce? And he went to his rabbi and the rabbi said, do you want a divorce? He says, no, I still love her. He goes, okay, let's try one last radical move. Ask her before the divorce if you can have one more night out. But this time, go out to the very place where you first met, where you first fell in love. And if there was music on, put the same tune on that you fell in love with. And he did that. And they went back out and they started talking and they started hearing the music that they heard on that first date. And all of a sudden, the emotions started getting rekindled. And all of a sudden, the love started flooding back. Why do I say this? Because my dear friends, what we're meant to experience on Shavuos is we're going back to our first date. We're going back to that marriage. We're going back to that music. Do you know what the music was? It was a thunder and lightning show. It says in the Bible, it says in, in Exodus, Koilos of Barakim, there was thunder and lightning. And it says, Koilos. We actually saw the sound. We got to a level of transcendence. Can you imagine what it means to see sound? We had this out-of-body experience where we're able to see sound and become genuinely transcendent and genuinely holy. The Baal Shem Tov and Shavuot and his 
in his show, they all saw the thunder and lightning. They saw the sounds, the same sounds. They were able to go back to that first date. Ask Rav Weinberg the following question. Why do most people not hear of the thunder and lightning? Why do most people don't know how to access that thunder and lightning? I've got news for you. And some of you, actually, this isn't your issue yet, but one day it will be. Any like newbies, this isn't the issue, but those who are long in the tooth and have been doing this for a while, it becomes the issue. What's the issue? For many people, the same problem with marriage. Sometimes we get lethargic, we get fatigued. There'll be some people, this shovel what? They'll be like, oh, really? Three days festival? There's rolling eyes. There's like, oh, okay, it's like ticking a box. So late and they're so complaining and they're not feeling it and they're just doing it because they have to. And many people, that's what Judaism is. It's if they do it, it's kind of forced. It's like force feeding a baby. Like we feel some Jewish people are force fed religion and they don't like it. Much. And there are many people that used to be very inspired and then eventually lose that inspiration. And maybe one of you listening is that. There was times in your life when you were super inspired. And now you're not. So tonight, I'd just like to give you a few pointers of how to fall back in love with Hashem. And the number one is, see if you can hear that thunder and lightning. See the Shavuot, if you can just, I'd like you to, when you, wherever you're reading the Ten Commandments, try and transport yourself back to Sinai. Try and close your eyes and just imagine you're back at Sinai. You might do it now. Close your eyes. Imagine you're at Sinai amongst three million of us, hearing Hashem say, I am Hashem, your God. Says Rav Weinberg, there's three ways to get re-inspired. And these are the three secrets I'm going to give you, which is my Shavuot present to you. Way number one, get out of the world. What do I mean? When Hashem said to Abraham, do you want to be part of the Jewish people? Do you want to have a eternal relationship with me? He says, say, achutza, you've got to get out. What does that mean, you've got to get out? Maybe Ein Muzzle the Israel. He actually took him out of this astrological sign. Abraham's zodiac was he wasn't going to have children. He rejigged Abraham's zodiac. He literally changed around Jupiter and Saturn, says the tractate in Shabbat. I think page 156. What's going on? My friends, we're so caught up in society. You know, during that whole COVID thing, we're caught up in COVID. Now we're, we're caught up in the high costs. You know, we're caught up in inflation. We're caught up in the Ukraine-Russia war. We're caught up in stress. We're caught up in the business. We're caught up on social media. We're caught up in this nonsense of this world. And I've got news for you. The Talmud says this world is called Alma de Shikra, the world of lies, the world of illusions. The Torah is called the tree of life. That's what life is. The world isn't one big magic tree. It's there to delude you and trick you to make you choose. Do you want to go for the material? Or are you able to see past it and go for the supernatural and go for the spiritual? Which one are you choosing? As it says in the Bible, there's life and death in front of you. Choose life. What is life? A lot of people think life is this world. Ola the physical world, the material world. When people are building palaces, they're building the palace in this world. So I said on my Monday night talk, if you haven't heard, I'll just really repeat it. Last week I was parking my car and someone reversed and smashed into my car. Had a big shot. Got out. And he's shouting at me. He's like, whose fault was that? And I'm like, mm, Hashem's. Hashem, it was Hashem. Hashem decided that's what happened. He goes, hmm, that's an interesting point. Then he saw, after he smashed into my car, and my car's got a huge big bash in, he had a tiny little dent on his, on his uh, tiny little scratch. It wasn't a dent, it was a scratch, a white scratch. And he's like, <gasps> he's literally panicking. He's about to start crying in the street. And he takes a baby wipe out and starts like polishing away the, the scratch. He's like, <gasps> gotta get rid of it. I think I need your insurance. Like, I've like, literally, he doesn't care about my huge, and dense and, and literally what I'm getting at is some people love their cars more than their children 
some people love their cars and their houses more than anything. Like man's house is his castle. No, it's not. It's, it's bricks and stones. And when we die, we don't take it with us. We shouldn't be living and loving our material. Some people love their clothes so much. God forbid, like someone stains it. It's like a whole nervous breakdown. You go and see a therapist for years because, you know, your new dress got stained. You can't, your, your beggar comes from Kabbalah's work, the traitor. It's a traitor. It's not the real you. We don't take our clothes with you. Even your body is not you. you. What's you is your soul. The house that you build is your Olam Habal house. It says in Pirkei Ovis, prepare yourself in the corridor before you get in the palace. Next world is the palace. But the way to live a Olam Habal existence is at times you need to step back from this world. Whether that be in meditation, whether that be, do you ever ask yourself just like, I know you do because you're all holy dudes, but does society generally just sit back and say, what's it all about? Am I going in the right direction? Am I being a good person? Am I being a nice person? Am I making a difference in this world? Am I maximizing my potential? A halavai, they talk about God and say, am I doing my mission that God's given? We should be asking ourselves this. I've got news for you three times a day. Most people don't do it three times a year. Some people don't do it three times in a lifetime. That's why the inspiration fades because we're tricked into this world and we lose ourselves in the material of this world tragically so step number one is just like abraham was told to go outside joseph when joseph's about to sin in potiphar's house what does the bible say by honor you ran out you've got to learn to step back actually shabbos is meant to do that every week that's the truth shabbos shouldn't be some routine if i'm reading books and going to sleep and having a walk in the park shabbos is a time to step back you're not working you're not involved in stress you can just breathe in Breathe in you and ask, what is it all about? That is step one. Number two, find a teacher. Find a teacher that sets you on fire. Let me tell you the story. There was a great rabbi called Revoka, the Volka Rob, the Volka Rebbe. And they came to, someone came to him. And said, why? Your Rebbe was this rabbi called Rav Simcha Bunim Pesishka. And he was actually a pharmacist. And at the time, there was a bit of controversy against some of the Hasidim. And they said, why is he your teacher? What does he really teach you? So the Rebbe said, let me tell you what he teaches me. And he quoted the story from Malachim Base, from book in the Bible of Kings 19. From the story, and you know, any, any of you know the story of Elijah? And Elisha, amazing story. I really recommend you look at it. Elio Anovi, Elijah the prophet, amazing stories. What happened to Elijah the prophet? He was told by Hashem, he's got to go and get the next prophet who's going to take over from him. Who was that? Elisha. Elisha at that point, he was essentially a peasant. Elisha was this peasant. And Elio went to find him and he's this peasant in the, in, the, in the fields. And he was looking after cows and plowing. And El Elio comes in and he's talking to the cows and saying, Yalla, yalla, move, move, move. And this great prophet, Elio Anovi, do you know what he does? He takes his coat, called the Averis Elio, his coat, and he puts his coat over him. Touches him with the coat. Literally, he's touched by the coat. That totally changed Elisha. All of a sudden, Elisha dropped what he's doing. And, and it just sparked him into life. And he said, wherever you go, I go. That's it, I'm with you now forever. And it changed his life and he became the next prophet. Just put on a coat. The Rebbe says, that's what my rabbi does to me. He sets his little fire in me. I've become who I'm meant to become because I found a teacher. You need to find a teacher that can do that. And if you haven't found one, sometimes you can find a safer that does that. Find a Jewish book that does that. Find a synagogue that does that. Find a community. Finds a place which sparks you up, which inspires the heck out of you. I was thinking, why a coat? Why did you put on a coat? What's the old coat? And I was thinking maybe this in my thoughts. A coat is something very individual. A coat is something made to measure, made to fit. A great rabbi, what he'll do for you, he'll allow you to bring your potential out of you. 
Every coat has its own design, has its own made to measure. Maybe that way Jacob gave Joseph a coat. The Kotzka Rebbe says when Hashem spoke at Sinai, which voice did he speak out of? Isn't that an interesting question? What did God sound like? Did he sound like the voice on the Ten Commandments, the film? Definitely not. What did he sound like? Amazing piece of Midrash. It says when he spoke to Moshe, he sounded like Moshe's dad. I'm wrong. He, he comforted him. Straight away, there was comfort. But says the Kotzka Rebbe, when he spoke, spoke to us, we all heard ourselves. So deep. We heard our voices speaking to us. Do you know why? Because when Hashem wants to relate to you, he wants to relate to you. He wants to talk to you based on who you are, Verda and James and Cyril and Roberta and Rifka. You're all coming from such radically different places. You all have your own godliness within you. And your job is to maximize the godliness within you, not to do what the rabbi does or what the parent does, or what the community does. What is it that you're meant to do? That's why when we're standing around Sinai, we started playing musical chairs. You know that the Midrash says, Hashem says, Moshe, you've got to get them to stand in the right place. Moshe spent time reorganizing where everybody stood. Do you know why? Because when the lights of the Torah came down, we had to be standing in the right place to receive it. Because the artists among us needed to hear the arty type of Torah. And the scientists among us needed to hear the scientific aspect of Torah. And the rationalists amongst us, like my dad and James, needed to hear the rational side of Torah. The altruists among us needed to hear the Abraham type of Torah. Those who had self-control needed to hear the Yitzchak type of Torah. Because that's what's going to spark you up, to light your fire. You've got to find out what is going to light your fire. Don't, a little bit, James, a little bit of a rationalist. I know you don't realize it, but you are, my friend. You're fighting it. But, but, but enjoy it. It's a blessing. We've, too many times we try and fit into the mold. We think we've got to make other people happy. Make yourself. That's what Hashem wants. There's God in you. So I just, I heard this week from the Baal Shem Tov. When you have a desire, if it's kosher, a kosher desire, a kosher need, something you want to pray for, it's actually Hashem who has that desire. And when you pray, you should say, Hashem, Help me fulfill the desire that you have. I'm not talking about like a desire like to have hog dogs or to eat some Pringles. I'm not talking about that desire. I'm talking about whatever it may be, whatever it may be. You know, I have a desire to go to Israel and, 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 and teach lots of people in Israel. So that means if I've got that desire, Hashem has that desire for me. That's why I'm feeling it. I don't feel the desire to go and become a doctor. I don't feel the desire to go and and, and, and do hot solar. And there's so many amazing charities out there, but the desire that I feel is, is, is Jewish outreach because that's what Hashem is channeling through me. And that's coming from Hashem, not from me. So number two is to work out what it is that you want and to light your fire, to light your fire. And finally, as we said, go back to that time when you were initially inspired. If any of you had a, a formative inspirational experience, try and relive that. When I was in Yeshiva and what changed my life forever is I went to this beautiful, I felt like I was in the Garden of Eden. It was in the middle of Yavne and there was these palm trees and I was learning Torah and I just felt I was in the Garden of Eden, literally. And then a few years later, I got very sick. I got really sick and I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was gonna have to come back and be fighting an illness. So I wrote three words. I wrote, Tiskareta Emes, remember the truth. Remember the truth. Because even though I knew I wasn't going to feel it at times, but I knew that there was a time when I did feel it. So what I'm saying to you is, when you're not feeling it, that's okay. You're not meant to feel it that day. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't say, ah, there's nothing to it. It just means you're having a bad day today. Ride it and wait for the next day to be a better day. But then try and rekindle that which you did feel. Often I say to couples the same thing, that they're in relation, if they fell in love and they had a great relationship and now they're not feeling it so much, try and fall back in love again. So those of you who, who aren't in love with God right now, it doesn't mean he's not out there. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It just means we need to do a bit of work to get us back into 
refalling in love again, but sometimes the way you fell in love in the first time can be the way you fall in love the second time. So please, God, Hashem should help us fall in love with Hashem all over again. We should all feel that love and that marriage, the Shavuos, which we said is about weeks, it's about prep. So you've still got three days to prepare, three days to prepare. The, the more you prepare, the more you want Hashem in your life, the more you love Hashem, the more you, you would love a relationship with Torah this year, the more Hashem will bless you. It's the new year for, for fruit. You are the fruit, the fruit of Torah. That's what Hashem is going to decide. May we all be blessed. May we, we all be blessed to have the maximum amount of Torah. May the world be blessed to have peace. May we all be blessed to have Mashiach. Amen.